You may be seated. If you'll take your copy of, there's an outline there in your worship guide. If you're new this morning, it's also in a, the Bible app. If you happen to have the Bible app, you can certainly uh, go there as well. It's also there as well. But this last week, we've been talking with our kiddos about raising their game, of, of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, and by maybe taking their walk to a new level. And for some, it was finding Christ as Savior and Lord. They had never made that decision to trust Christ, and they, they did that this week. And some were taking steps in that direction. And this morning, I want to kind of continue in that thought about Thursday night. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. So if you have a copy of God's Word, if you take and turn to Galatians chapter 5, it's in the New Testament. You can go to Matthew and take a right and go about, about six or seven books over. You'll find the book of Galatians. If not, it'll be on the screen here in just a moment. What we're talking about with our, your children about what it means to follow Christ. I don't know if we're able to get those bottom line slides. I don't know that I got those for you. And our bottom line, let me just tell these for you um, this morning. Our kiddos, we talked about the first day that God wants you to know him. That's the first thing. We talked about Abram uh, and, and his following God. We then talked about you can know God through his word. We talked about King Josiah and, and the understanding that they'd forgotten about God's word, but he had rediscovered it and they valued and the importance of God's word. Then we talked about that God sent Jesus to save us. We talked about the story of John the Baptist and baptizing Jesus and the importance for us to know Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. And we talked about those ABCs, your boys and girls, on Thursday about it, admitting to God they were a sinner and ask them to forgive them of all their sins to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and is the Son of God and he came and died for them and rose again to concede and confess him as Savior and commit their life to him as Lord. We talked with them about what that means. The fourth day we talked about Pentecost which is the time the Holy Spirit was given uh, on this earth in Acts chapter 2 and that God sent his Spirit to help you. That was the fourth day's bottom line. The last one was you can help others to know God. We ended up talking about helping others know God. And the fruit of the Spirit talks about ways we can demonstrate to a lost and dying world what a follower of Christ looks like. Well, what does somebody look like who has trusted Christ that follows him? What does their life look like? And Galatians chapter 5 talks about what that looks like. That scripture verse we talked with him about, was, and they heard one of the groups mention it, that God's power has given us everything we need to live a godly life. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. And talking about that power, that what we're talking about this morning, where you're perhaps prayerfully trying to raise your children to come to understand, is very different than what our culture teaches them and how they should act and how they should live and how they should walk. And for you as parents, the, the call and the pressure for you and for me is the same for us to do things and fit into a certain mold. But God's word and God's standards are very different than that many times. Now, there's sometimes some crossover, certainly that is the case. But by and large, our culture and our flesh and our world are diametrically opposed to the way that God has called us to live. Matter of fact, we're talking about this summer in a summer message series. There's a card in your worship guide this morning. We're talking about elephants in the room this summer. We're going to tackle some really hard and difficult and challenging topics and see what the Word of God has to say and how the gospel speaks into those issues in fact, it's, just, it's a really kind of a deep topic. We're going to we're really kind of give it a PG-13 rating. We're going to provide um, uh, for your students K through up through fifth grade. Um, the other ones are already in the back already, but we'll let them slip out after the end of the music time because we're going to cover topics on a very uh, adult level, if you will. Um, you can choose to let them stay. We're offering that alternative for parents to say, you know, I just know my kids, kids ready for that. We're going to tackle some heavy, heavy topics that our culture and our world is talking about and is proclaiming there is freedom if you go the world's way in these particular issues. But what I want you to see is the gospel, in fact, speaks the exact opposite. Freedom is not what the world defines as freedom. It's different. And here in Galatians, Paul talks about to the Galatian church, the believers there, he tells them that we are called to live free in Christ. That we're not tied down to anything, that nothing or anyone has control over us. And so Paul is talking to these believers in Galatia, but I had to believe there are others there that were perhaps listening and watching. So maybe this morning you're not a Christ follower, and that's okay. We're so thrilled that you were here. It makes our day even more special today. But maybe you're, you're a seeker, you're listening, you're learning. Maybe you grew up in church as a child, but you've been out for a while. But I want you to listen and hear these encouraging words today that talk about how we can be a follower of Christ and what that is to look like in comparison to that of the world. So here, let's look in chapter 
5, beginning in verse number 16. Let me read these verses together, and then we'll unpack them for just a few moments together. It says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, they're obvious, which are these things. Immorality, uh, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, and carousing. And things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, strong words there, isn't it? Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified with the flesh, with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Four thoughts I want to leave with you this morning that I think are very important for us to pick out in these nine or ten verses. The first thing is, Paul tells us, there is a continual calling. There is a continual calling, and Paul tells him we are to live by the Spirit. Now, Paul says in direct contrast to what others were living in the times that he is writing to this church here in Galatia, In contrast, in comparison to what the culture was teaching, Paul says there is a calling to live in freedom. And he he tells us two things about that calling. Number one, this call is specifically to walk by the Spirit. Now, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? That might seem a little bit odd to some of you this morning. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Well, it means this, that we follow Christ, we yield our lives to the control of the Holy Spirit and to God's Word. It is clear here that we have a choice that we have to make every single day and literally moment by moment as to what will or who will control our lives. Will we walk according to our ways, according to our desires, our wants, our direction, or will we walk as the Holy Spirit guides us and leads us and as we rely on the Holy Spirit and allow Christ to show us how we need to walk and how we need to live and what decisions we need to make. So there is a call. The second thing is, there is a result of us following that call. And he says here, is that we won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Now, we're going to talk about this in a moment. But the ways of the flesh lead to destruction. They don't lead to freedom as the culture, as our flesh, and even as Satan the enemy will promise us and tell us and try to convince us that this is the way to live. This is the way you ought to do. This is what freedom is really like. But folks, the exact opposite is really, really true is that God teaches us so clearly that freedom comes by following Christ Jesus. And as a result, we won't carry out those things. So those who are followers of Christ, if we are full of the Spirit, we'll be so focused on that that we will not be focused on the things of the world and of the flesh, which leads to destruction. So Paul gives very clearly, right out of the gate in verse 16, there is a very clear and a continual calling. Notice foe in verse 17 and 18 tells us the second thing. There is a considerable conflict. There is a considerable conflict. We're talking about a major conflict. Now, sometimes you might have seen TV shows or movies where there's, this, uh, there's a, a guy that's got an angel on one shoulder and a, a devil on the other, right? And there's this battle between the good and, and bad and evil, right? I want to take that, and that is a, 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 a decent analogy to start with, right? But let's take it much further. It is not that whimsical. It is not that, uh, that easy. In fact, it is the exact opposite. The Bible tells us there is a conflict, there is a war that is going on between our flesh and between our spirit. Even for those of us who know Christ as Savior and Lord, there is still a drawing to our old way of life. There is a drawing to the flesh and our, we are bombarded with it in our culture and our day all the time. Now, as believers, we're not called to put our heads in the sand and pretend it's not there. In fact, we're called to do the opposite. We're supposed to be in the world, just not of the world. And so how do we avoid and how do we deny those things? Well, we've heard the calling. We're to be full of the Spirit of God. But there is this conflict. We need to recognize the fact there is a conflict between the Spirit and the flesh. And why is that? Because here's the, here's the truth. The outcomes, the results are vastly different. They are diametrically opposed. 
the way of the world and the way of the culture and flesh tells you this. Listen to me carefully. It is your way, right away, all the time, how you want it, how you like it. You're free. You're free to do anything and everything you want to do. That's what our world says is the way to freedom. But in fact, what we'll find as we talk about this summer, that only leads to being enslaved. It only leads to addictions. It only leads to brokenness. God's way is the best way. God's way is the right way, boys and girls, as we talked about this week. That we follow his path and his truth for our lives, then we'll be on the right path. You see, it comes down to really two things about this conflict. Number one is all about control. It's all about control. Have you seen that video from times gone by where somebody would say, you ain't the boss of me? Have you seen that? All right, you're not the boss of me, right? We love, as adults, whether we think about it or not, we like to say that nobody is the boss of me, right? I determine what I do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And secretly, whether we say it or not, I say it all the time, right? When I get in a vehicle, I have to drive because I have to be the boss. I have to be in charge. It's a control problem, right? So I, I think to myself, I'm a better boss than anybody else when it comes to driving, and I might even tell you that as you pass me or as you get in my way or as you, you know, whatever. Hopefully very Christ-like, of course, I hope. Right? We all tend to, tend to buck under authority. We don't like it. Our flesh says, I want to do what I want to do. And yet, Paul tells the believers there in, in Galatians, all comes down to control. And here it is. The best way, the right way is to surrender our hearts and our lives and our will to Christ Jesus and to be guided and filled by the Holy Spirit of God. That is the way, that is the control that we need to have. And folks, let me just tell you, it goes a whole lot better when we do it that way. Those of us who are control freaks, we think if we can kind of hang tight and kind of keep it under control, we'll kind of help God out like God needs us. Right, we live sometimes, I do, I live sometimes if God is saying, hey Brad, can you handle that? This seems to be a little out of control. Right, can you handle this part of your life or can you go handle this world conflict over here? Because I seem to not be able to handle it. Folks, God is in control. And he does not need my help, nor does he need yours. What does he call of us? The best way to live that leads us to a path of where we're not anxious. We are not living in fear. Live in a path of surrender. The second thing is we have to make a choice. In this conflict, we have to make a daily choice between the flesh and the spirit. And let's be really honest. Can we be honest this morning? The flesh and our culture, to please it, is very loud. We might want to deny and act like it's not that loud, but it is the truth. It is loud. It is constant in our ears. And listen, the enemy tries to tell us, you deserve it. Nobody will know. Listen to these things, these lies the enemy gives us. Nobody will ever know. Nobody's going to care. If nobody knows, it won't hurt anybody else. You have a right. You have a privilege. You're old enough. You're free. Right? We hear all those things. And we tend to inch our way that direction. When the way that Christ calls us to the narrow path, not the wide path that leads to destruction, but the narrow road that leads to life is to make a daily choice to give my life to Jesus. Now, that's something we do one time, give our lives to Christ. But this idea of a daily decision we have to make, will we walk in the spirit or will we walk in our way, the way of the flesh, the way of the enemy, the way of our culture? Notice the third thing this morning. There is a clear contrast. There is a very, very clear contrast. Paul tells us in 19 to 23, these verses here, there is a clear evidence. Now, he calls it fruit. The results, the outward effect of how we choose to live our lives. So when I decide that I'm going to live a certain way, if I decide that I'm going to live by the flesh and live by the way of the world, then this is the result of what my life will look like. If I live the way of Christ, and he tells us this is what it's going to look like. He calls it fruit, right? It's what he kind of talks about here. Hence why we see the fruit of the Spirit. So it gives us two things, the evidence of how we live our lives. Now, I can say all day long that I am this, 
right? I can say I am a Christian, I am a follower of Christ, but here's the truth. What is the fruit that backs that up? What is the evidence? Now, it is not my place nor yours to ever judge anyone. Christ is the judge. But Jesus is abundantly clear that he says, by the fruit, you will know them. Right? So the evidences of our lives should indicate who it is that we follow. Who it is that we have surrendered our lives to. Who it is we've made the choice to surrender to Christ. He tells two different things, two different ways to look at it. First one is the fruits of the flesh, the carnal. Here Paul lays out 15 different things. This is by no means an exhaustive list. But he gives us 15 different ways to think about what the ways of the world are look like. Now, I don't have time, nor will I take the time to do it, to go through and talk about each of these individually. They, they certainly speak for themselves. But let me just read it again from a different translation to give us kind of an idea of what we're talking about here. This is from the message translation. So it kind of talks about, well, let me read from the good news translation. Here's what it says. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immoral, filthy, and indecent actions. In worship of idols and witchcraft, people become enemies and they fight. They become jealous and angry and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious. They get drunk. They have orgies. They do other things like these. I warn you now, as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. Paul very clearly tells us what these are like. And some people kind of divide these into four different categories. He talks about sexual sin. He talks about religion. He talks about, and not in a good way, and he talks about relationship and indulgence is how we indulge our flesh. So the real thing is for us to take a look at our lives. And what does our life look like? Does it look more like this list? Or does it more look like the list we'll talk about in just a moment? Now he says here, I want you to notice something. He says here, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that seems to be a perplexing statement. Because some people say, oh my goodness. So if I've ever been drunk before, I'm, never, I'm not going to go to heaven. Is that what that means? The answer is... No, that's not what that means. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't get drunk? No, that's not what I'm saying either. But what I am saying is that what he's talking about here is this is a lifestyle. This is the way that you live your life. If you live your life a certain way, according to these ways of the flesh and other ones we could mention, if you are never confessional, you're never repentant, and I'm okay and I'm comfortable living in the way of the world and I'm fine there and I have no problems there, then there needs to be a point. You need to evaluate your life and see, am I a follower of Jesus or not? Because Paul doesn't mince any words here. He says very clearly, if we live in this lifestyle and walk in this way with great comfort and great ease, with no conviction, no repentance, then there is a clear warning. We all sin, folks. All of us the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone, the preacher and anybody else you want to include. So it doesn't mean that we, just because we sin, we don't go to heaven. Now, initially, yes, that is the truth. Because we all are sinners, we will not go to heaven without Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Once I, go, once I begin to know Christ, my life begins to take a different direction. Now, it does not mean that I will not, again, as we talked about, nor you, we have these temptations that come. And there may be seasons where we are prodigals and we walk away from God's truth. But there's always this idea that we return. We come back to the truth of God's word. Then he lists this next section, students, that we talked about, kiddos. We talked about the fruits of the spirit. What a transformed life would look like. One that is spirit-filled, full of the spirit of God. In direct contrast to these fruits of the flesh. Now let me tell you, I say fruits. It is actually the fruit of the spirit. I put on your outline, it's fruits. But as I did my studying this week, later on... I discovered that I kind of messed it up. You see, it's really just the fruit of the Spirit. Because here is the result. If I'm being full of the Spirit of God, if I'm yielding my life to the Spirit of God, then guess what happens? These things will be a natural outflow, right? This is not some, some list, if you will, uh, of character qualities where determine how to act, right? It's not how I should be living. It's not like... Um, let me find my, my statement here. It's not a list of things we need to work on or try harder to be patient or to be kind. It's not a list of emotions either, but instead there are character qualities that are determined by how we act, not by how we feel. They are an outward indicator of our salvation. Again, as Jesus said, you will know you. 
by your fridge. We talked about one of the songs talked about is that we want the world to know that we trust in you. How do they know that? Because we live and our lives are full of these fruits of the Spirit. They become a part of the natural part of our lives. Now, you can divide these into lists or not. Just for our discussion this morning to think about. We're going to look at them in three different ways. And these kind of cross over, so they're not some hard, static, um, rigid things, but just to kind of take a look at these fruits of the Spirit very quickly. Number one, he tells us the Godward aspects, love, joy, and peace. The idea of love, boys and girls, we talked about is to know the deep love of God and in turn to love Him above anything and everything else. Because God loves us, we are then in turn to genuinely love other people. We're, we're called to have that agape love. It is a love that only God has that God will give to us to love one another. So love, secondly, is joy, a sense of happiness that is unaffected by life's circumstances that comes with a deep sense of, of satisfaction. A deep sense that all is well between you and Christ Jesus. It is not an emotion by any means because that is what happiness is. But instead is a, a, a sense of contentment and optimism in God. There is love, joy. Third, there is peace. This idea of tranquility of mind and a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, this is peace not because everything in my life is going well. But in spite of the fact that things might not be going so well, I have God's peace. I spoke to somebody a few weeks ago. They were telling me they were walking through some very, very difficult moments in their lives. And they were talking about it. Said, you know, I've, I've, I've heard about it and I've even prayed about it before. But I've never really until this moment experienced what God's word says. That God will give you the peace that passes all understanding. This person said, Pastor, I can't explain it. I don't really know how to put it into words. But I just want you to know that I have experienced the peace that comes from God. No matter. Now, their circumstances have not changed. But God gives us his peace. And that peace is shown by how we live. The love, joy, and peace. The, the fourth one, these next three, are kind of how we treat one another. Patience, a, courage, a courageous endurance without quitting with either situations or people. Folks, we are very impatient people, aren't we? Let's just be honest, right? We go somewhere and we're up in arms because... The line at Walmart is deep. Or we go to a drive through and they take more than 46 seconds to get our food to us, right? We are in up in arms. I'm in a hurry. I have places to go. I have places, people I have to see, right? And yet one of the evidences of Christ living in us is that we are patient people, right? I've been to restaurants and, and I've seen people act so un-Christ-like to servers. And I'm just like, man... You know, it's been told before, and this is a great fresh word to how the fruit of the spring life. You know what, you know what some servers will tell you one of the days they dread the most? This is terrible. Sundays. Because it seems to be that Christians are cheap tippers, and they're not very patient. I mean, think about it. My hope is built on nothing less. You are the sorriest server. That is the worst service I've ever gotten. Have you ever stopped and thought that God was patient with you? And God was patient with me. Boy, we ought to be so careful, shouldn't we? To have the patience of God. Secondly, kindness. Having a, a tender concern for other people. To treat others with compassion and mercy as Christ has done us. He says goodness. Speaking of doing good things, being generous to others. That goodness, by the way, only comes from God. You can only define the word good by including God in it. For God is the definition of goodness. The last three, quickly. There were selfward aspects, things we look on the inside of ourselves. Faithfulness means being loyal and trustworthy, dependable, no matter what comes our way. Boys, believers, we ought to be faithful in our walk with Christ. We ought to be faithful. The best employees, the best employers ought to be children of God. Boy, if I had a dollar for every time I've talked to somebody that has a business, and here's what I'll hear almost every single time, I can't find faithful, dependable people who either want a job or who show up for a job on a regular basis. We as believers ought to exude, ought to, ought to show and demonstrate by being full of the Spirit of God that we are faithful people, especially in hard and difficult times. The last two, gentleness. This idea of gentleness, also the word meekness is often used. And we hear the word meekness and we think kind of wimpy and kind of uh, um, 
uh, kind of a pansy, if you will. We think that's how it was. But listen, Jesus described himself only one time in Scripture. He described himself as meek and humble in heart. Now, I don't think Jesus was Rambo either by any means, but I don't think Jesus was a wimp. You know what the word here means? It means strength under restraint. Right? It'd be kind of like, Brian, can I, can I pick on you a minute? Is that okay? Do you mind? Can you come here just one second? I want to demonstrate gentleness to you real quick, and then I'm almost done. I didn't tell him ahead of time to do this, but I just want you to get the visual here. I get several men in our church that do this, right? Um, so, Brian's just a little shorter than me. Not much, just a little. And... Um, Make me nervous. I'm going to back up a little bit. Anyway, so, so strength right here, right? Okay, I can't even get my hands around his arms, right? This is, so if I were to, and I'm not going to because I love the Ole Miss Rebels, right? Uh, if I were to insult Brian's Ole Miss Rebels or his wife or his children, okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to pretend to do it because I don't want to see what would happen. But what could Brian do to me? Okay, let's just be honest. Kiddos, what would Brian do to me? Pummel me, thank you, big word, that was a nice word. Pummel you, thank you so much. I would have gotten at least one hit in maybe before I got knocked out, right? I could be Rocky Balboa, right? This is Apollo Creed, I'm Rocky Balboa, right? now. What happens is this, this, when we want to do something that we're capable of doing, Brian could, it is true, he could pummel me, he is capable of doing that. Here is gentleness, strength under restraint. Does that make sense? We can have God's strength. Powerful. God is a powerful God. But aren't you glad he's gentle with you and me? Thank you, Brian. You're so kind. You did good. He did good. Didn't even give him a hand? Thank you, Brian. You did a great job this morning. Thank you for not pummeling me. That's a good word. Self-control, the last word. Man, if there is a way to describe our culture, it is no self-control. Our world has abandoned itself, our culture. There is no self-control. It's whatever you want, however you want it, whenever you want it. And yet as believers in Christ, we are to restrain our passions and appetites. To hold our tongue or our temper. And yet I've met people, again, that are believers. And I've heard over the years of my 30 years of doing ministry... How the, a husband would talk to his wife and yell and scream and curse and do the same with his employees and think, oh, it's fine, it's no big deal. It's not self-control. We're not full of the Spirit of God. Now, again, this is not a laundress we check off and go, well, I'm, I'm pretty good on one through six, but boy, eight through nine, I've got to kind of work on, right? I need to work on God. Can you pray me? I need to pray for some patience, self-control. Nothing wrong with praying that. But can I give you a prayer before that point? God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit that I would be like you? That I would treat others like you? That I would walk like you? I would talk like you? I would have compassion and mercy on people like you? I would see people the way that you see them. I would love people the way that you love them. Lord, fill me with your spirit that I could have joy even in the midst of sorrow and difficulties. Give me peace in the midst of a storm because I'm standing on the solid rock. See, it comes, we're full of the spirit of God. The last point, and I'm done this morning, is this. Is there's a certain conquest as we end this morning. He tells us two things about this conquest in verses 24 and 25. He says, believers belong to Jesus. Believers belong to Jesus. He tells us early in Galatians chapter 2, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Indicating this, that he has been crucified. Christ was crucified on our behalf. And as a result, our flesh, when we find Christ as Savior and Lord, has been crucified. Our sins have been forgiven, washed away. If we will accept that truth, ask for forgiveness, believe, confess Him as Savior, commit our life to Him as Lord, then guess what? We have been crucified with Christ. But now there's a part for us to play. Now here's what I know to be true, folks. Some of us can decide today... I'm just using some examples and easy when it comes to my mind. Maybe you have a problem with a colorful language, all right? And you're, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to do that. Can I just give you a word? You might do great tomorrow. But by Thursday, most of us, including myself, will have forgotten the four wonderful points of my sermon. Now, be honest, it's okay. 
That's why we give you an outline. Hopefully you can refer to it later. You can watch it online later. Listen to it. Here's what I know to be true. Our, our, our um, what's the right word? Our, our desire, our want to, our commitment usually isn't real good. Because it's not about what we do. It's about what Christ does in and through us that matters. See, it goes back to that decision. I have to trust in Christ, but then I have a part that I have to play, right? I have to yield to the Spirit, but then I have a part to play. I have to discipline myself to read God's Word. I have to discipline myself to be full of the Spirit of God. I have to discipline myself to, to have these fruit of the Spirit in my life. There's a part I have to play. I can't just say, well, I love God and then go out and live like the devil, right? I have to make some conscious decisions. I have to choose to reject and turn my back on the world and the flesh that calls me and walk in the Spirit. Even though it will yell loudly at you, it will call you, it will pull you. But yet Jesus says, if we are full of the Spirit of God, what does it say? Believers will live and walk in the flesh. Four thoughts. Consciously, consistently, and courageously. This week, say no to sin. Repeatedly remind yourself of who you are in Christ. Pursue God's will, His desires, and His calling no matter what. No matter the cost, be full of the Spirit of God. Forsake your weaknesses and depend on the strength. Of God. Dear friend, our desire for you, if you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, is that you would know Him. Now, see, what the, we know is that sometimes we can counterfeit the fruits of the Spirit. You know, I've met people that really probably have all these characteristics. They have these fruit of the Spirit. They're really nice people. They're full of love. They're joyful. They're at peace. They seem to be. They're kind. They're gentle. They don't lose their temper. But they're not a follower of Christ. See, here's the difference. Watch this. Don't miss this as we close. If I'm full of the Spirit of God, my life will do what we talked about, boys and girls, on Thursday. It will bring glory to the name of Jesus. That's what it will do. People will be attracted and drawn to you because of who they see living in you and through you. If it's not... It'll draw attention to yourself. Hopefully when people say to you, well, I see this difference in you, you simply say, I promise you, if you knew my heart, sometimes it's sinful and wretched. you got to know it's only God. That's all it could be. Would you pray with me this morning as we close?